Hey, what's up guys? This is Fabio Gallo and today is the 22nd of November and you're welcome to the Friday's podcast. So today I'm going to talk about the 10 biggest marketing mistakes that in the B2B uh, business we used to do. So over the last, let's say, 15 years, I've been often seen you know, many common B2B marketing mistake and uh, I've been working with that and then train and train many businesses to try to avoid those kind of mistakes. So today with you, I'd like to share these knowledges and try to find out what are the biggest mistakes and how we can definitely optimize them for the near future. So the first big mistakes that I see in many companies is to have a proper incorrect product positioning. So I don't know if you've ever been in a situation like you have launched a product that you think is super, that is amazing, and then you find that you have a slight problem so that no one else really understands what you do. So this is why positioning should be the right up there on your real priority list. Um, and before you get deep into you know, marketing strategy, tactics, you must get your positioning right. So. Uh, some of some of you may remember a, a famous book that I, I, I read a few a few years ago called Positioning: The Battle of Your Mind. It was written by uh, Rice and Trout, and basically this book described positioning as how your product is the best in the world at providing something that a well-defined set of customer cares a lot about. So, uh, if you flip side that. Positioning defines basically who your target customer is, defines what your differentiation is, and also defines you know, uh, the, the value that you bring to the customer. So this is something that you, know, you need to work out at real beginning of everything, understanding really what's the target, what's the differentiation you're going to bring in the market, and, and the value at the end that, you, that your customer will give with this product. The second biggest mistake that I normally see is that you don't set up properly uh, Google Analytics and you don't set up basically an analytics tool to track, to track your leads, to track your B2B leads. So the first thing that uh, normally uh, is missing is, to have, is not to have actually goals set up on your website. So, and this is, this is a pretty common mistake. I'd say 90% of the company that I normally talk to, they don't have any analytics or they, maybe they have it, but they are not using properly, or maybe they have it, but they don't have any people inside the company that oversee them. So this is a very common mistake. And then, as this, this is a basic level, you want to track an inquiry form or someone clicking on, for example, an email address, right up to logging a conversion when someone pays to use, say, um, you know, software as a service, uh, or buying a product directly to your website. But don't just go for the big hitting goals. So that's another, you know, uh, differentiation that you need to do. You need to know how little guys are doing. Um, for instance, I want you to think about your goals from a macro and micro level. So why this is very important? Because let's say that your site converts at 4%. That means out of, out of every 100 people, four party with their cash. That's a great result. But what did the other 96 people do? I thought they didn't convert. Understanding their behavior is still a variable. So you can, you can learn what triggers and activates uh, you know, those visitors along with that maybe holding your site back. So let's think for a moment that hypothetically, let's say that we are selling a software as a service product. Uh, an email marketing platform direct to marketeers. So here you have some clear business objective and goals to track, right? So uh, the, object, the business objective would be sell more online subscription, reduce, for instance, the churn, upsell basic users to the next subscription packages. So those, for instance, are the common, let's say, business objective that I would say uh, you, you must track. On, on the right, right hand side of you know, a potential spreadsheet that I normally do when I work with companies is you will have goals. Because so there, those, the business objective are our micro, macro, macro objective. And then you, dig, you start to dig into 
to uh, you know look at ne- underneath and then you see the goals right so goals for instance could be uh, increasing the sales increasing the unique visitors reducing churn uh, to a certain percent- percentage that could be 15 20 percent whatever you think that is is right and and another goal is upgrade the package right then you need to start to think about the kpi that you know will be associated to each individual goals so kpi in this case could be i don't know monthly the monthly revenue that you generated or the monthly unit visitors or uh you know the percentage of churn um compared to maybe the the, the previous month or the previous year and 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 the purchase upgrades so how many people have uh, really did an upgrade compare for instance uh, to, to last month so those are uh, you know the, the biggest and the, and the smallest let's say results that, uh, and track that you need to do um, so I like to map out the flow of the business through their funnel from top to bottom and check what tracking solution they need based on their website configuration so this is a worthy exercise to do as you may find that you are not tracking everything correctly enough for you to understand and find a solution to the question uh, you are trying to answer for example you have a lot of video content assets and you want to know if they help people convert for a free trial right this is a very good example and in especially in in my vertical that is ott business it's something that i used to see a lot so therefore a micro goal would be watch a video right so this is one of the micro goals that, sh- that, sh- that you should track and i i i know that most of the people that i'm talking to uh, most of the companies neither think about the this kind of micro goal and in your analytics audit, you need to check and set up event tracking on your website to see this data. So you could you could check, for instance, the scroll reach, um, the watch video, the watch uh, webinar in case is, is another ma- webinar, uh, the social share, the the live chat, the CTA click. So you have different CTAs in, in different position of the pages, and you need to track what what are the ones that are converting more. Then you need to, to you know, uh, to check the how many people and then they are registering. So they are, uh, you're getting a lead generation form uh, for the content that you are publishing. Uh, how many people are requesting free video access? Uh, how many people are ac- accessing to one month trial, for instance? And then they, they, for instance, unsubscribe to, or they don't follow up with the subscription. How many people are creating accounts? How many users watch video and how to get started? How many users, once they already subscribed, how, how many of them will log into your account? And so this is, good, for instance, a, a good metric for engagement. So all these kind of metrics are extremely important. So to really add some weight to the goals and to help build segments, um, add a value to the goal. So you can do something as simple as going down your list of goals and adding l- like a sliding scale. And still better if you know what your conversion rate are at each, each stage of the funnel, you can do some basic math to work out what each micro and micro goals is worth to the business. So those ones are really important. So. You need to get these events tracked to Google Tag Manager. That's very important. But the insights and benefits are wonderful. Events can give you a load of information about additional activities that happen on your website, which are not tracked as standard, you know, as a standard feature by Google Analytics. So having a proper Google Tag Manager can track, can help you to, you know, to track all the events. So what if, for instance, the user download an app and an engaged PDF? Add it to a basket, play the video, share on social media, and print it the page. So this is this is a kind of event that you need to track. And one of the reasons I've seen B two B sites that not having any goal set up was down to their you know to their site built in a way that any inquiry form or lead form was a submitted button with no destination URL to go. 
the team had assumed that they were unable to track that goal. So this is another big mistake. And in these cases, guys, you're going to have to set up, you know, uh, the event using Google Tag Manager and use the category, action, and label of the event to build your goal. So this is another uh, extremely important mistake. Again, um, I know that most of the companies uh, don't have you know analytic people inside or don't have time to dig into you know uh, this specification about how to set up a proper analytics tools, what kind of analytics tool, etc. So if you have any doubts, you always are welcome to write me an email. My email is fabio at fabiogallo.co.co. So you can, you can reach me out whenever you want. I'm happy to help you and, and to find a way to generate more leads for you. The third biggest mistake is not, not testing improvements. So when you have free, free tools like Google Optimize, uh, Optimizely for your website, and nearly all campaigns programs from Google Ads to email a free option to test, and people are not still doing it. So you have a lot of things that you don't probably neither know that are totally free to use, like Google Optimize, and you're not using that. So A-B testing is not just for e-commerce, guys. Uh, it's not just for e-commerce testing to see whether a man or a woman, your brand imaginary, encourages more people to convert. You should be testing everything at a time. Make it a company culture. A few small changes is all it can you know uh, take to make your marketing efforts go further. So we all have a leaky bucket. Wouldn't be nice to understand what stops people from converting, for instance. Uh, so now you can, and, but until you start to test and have a data to show that what works and what it doesn't, you're just another person with an opinion. So I really don't like people that you know they take. I don't say that the qualitative uh, information or subjective information are not worthy, but I really love people that comes to the table and have a qualitative opinion, so their subjective opinion, but also you know they have a quantitative opinion, so they have numbers, number to justify um, or to you know to have a strategy behind what they are thinking. So if you have a low conversion rate, for instance, that you know, happen very often. You cannot be sure that it is because of your button color, for instance. So to really understand what your website biggest barriers to conversion are, you probably need to put yourself in, in the, basically the user shoes. So it could be down to a lack of trust on your website due to a date web design or confusing copy with no clear value proposition, or maybe perhaps the, the marketing campaigns that lead users to your website sends them to the wrong product or landing page. In other words, your user experience, you, you, UX, may suck. <laughs> so conversion rate optimization is not about guessing what your user want. Uh, I mean, gut feeling are important, as I mentioned, but for you to really understand the issue, uh, we need to look. We need to look at doing some usability testing. Actually, ask your customer, for instance, to complete certain tasks on your website and see where they are. They get stuck. Uh, again, Google Analytics is wonderful, but all data is just a proxy for people. You need to blend some qualitative and quantitative data to really base your hypothesis on. So now. Guys, what, what, what you should test it, right? Because so far so good, but what should I test it? You can test really anything, and I mean anything. So you can test call to action, uh, the location of the bottom, the color shapes and sizes, uh, um, the content, how your content is displayed. Uh, you know, for instance, do users prefer to scroll or click through another page to learn more? So all this kind of stuff, you can test your forms, uh, you can test your images, your navigation. Uh, you have really so many possibilities that it's impossible, basically, that you're not testing. So you don't need to run off and totally recreate a landing page. Just testing the work can make such a difference. So that's for sure something that, in my opinion, I see as a, another big mistake. The mistake number four is buying technology and not knowing how you will use it. So again, this is something that I uh, see almost every single day. So companies are buying product, are buying also expensive technology, 
but neither they have resources internally to uh, operate them. And, but the most important thing, they neither know how to properly use um, therefore, uh, they have been, you know, trained for many, many hours or they have spent many, many hours looking for this kind of product. So, sales is using one CRM, right? Marketing is using a marketing automation tool, both not talking to each other and thinking that some new t tech tool is the magic wand to make things better and the reality that this isn't. So CRM and marketing automation, they, they, are, they have to be connected and you need processes, you need proce procedures, you need data and content in place for it to work. I've spoken for, to, to, you know, to many marketing directors recently uh, who are spending time doing admin to add more details to the database, which is just an email address and sometimes a name, right? Uh, again, we, we need to change a little bit the approach to, to marketing, in my opinion, that clearly when I say marketing, I also touch the point of sales, I touch the point of, uh, um, you know, product people. So it's less outbound and more inbound, right? More sales enablement than sales support. But when it comes to changing our legacy technology to a more cutting edge solution, you need to, you know, you need, to, you need a change management plan. Um, so the, the first point here is have a good understanding of your customer. So what content are they looking for? What kind of format? Map out what you're going to do with your user flow and the ideal responses you want you know, your prospect and customer to make. Uh, the, the, the second point would be audit your team skill set. So, and again, this is extremely important because you, you will see that probably the people that are in your company or uh, that you have hired for this particular, um, you know, marketing or sales or product, uh, you know, uh, focus are not probably the best. The tech always looks so cool and easy to use when you get the demo run through by someone who uses the tool every single day. That that a common that's a common thing, right? When you don't know what you don't know, so speak to your team, and this is not a witch hunt. <laughs> Who needs training? Most companies, you know, they sell the shiny toys, have resources and training sessions to get the most out of the tool. Um, so my company, uh, ViewLift, has a number of guides to bring you and your team up to speed on how you are going to approach the tools from a strategic point of view. So we definitely love... Uh, for instance, in, uh, in, in, in ViewLift, doing a lot of demo, uh, making sure that our customer understand, for instance, all the 130 data, data points that we track. Uh, the reality is that not many of our customers are using it and are using it properly. So, and you have to have an organizational cross-function. So the tool we use across over a number of departments and so bring them on board and do it early. So sales and marketing need to be always aligned, guys. You may need to get legal involved for data and privacy issue. You maybe have finance that we want to know what it will cost and you show how the investment will improve, for instance, the sales process. You, you probably need IT uh, that will need to help with workflows and possibly on integrating legacy systems. Uh, etc um, and and that's that's about organization and cross function right and then another point would be to to have a create create a roadmap uh, I thought you are buying a technology you need to have your own roadmap you need to define the project you need to define the strategy before the working the work begins and you sign on the dotted line so I had a good chat about this topic with uh, different founders, co-owners, and, and, and many you know, uh, directors that I'm talking to. And it, it, it has worked for large multinational technology-oriented transformation projects for large multinational companies, and now helps you know, small startups and establish small medium enterprise that, to take advantage of, for instance, cloud technology, to better engage customer, reduce their cost, increase profitability. So we do work with Amazon, for instance, for this, and we have a strong alignment 
with 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 Amazon uh, in order to have 100% to be 100% cloud based. So we reduce the cost of you to operate on the technology, so that you don't have any excuse and you can you can really you can really. Uh, set your investment in other uh, strategic area like for instance analytics or resources uh, in order to boost your sales the number fifth uh, mistake that I see is not aligning content assets to the sales funnel so this is another quite big mistakes that I see um, and you know the drill you know create original relevant content that mirror your persona pain points Use it to communicate a message to your audience and hope you know to drive a profit a profitable customer retention. So this is the drill, and, and and the content is a meaty subject and needs to have you know a defined strategy. If it's your website, your email programs, your social comms, everything. When when I you know when I talk about this topic with many company or work with clients on content, I almost always get a response that they have a content marketing strategy. But when you dig in, it's typically an editorial calendar. So after you have defined your personas, that's something that is not super easy. So someone could define a persona, and most of the people, actually most of the company, think there is just one persona that is clearly not like that, guys. So you need to really dig into understanding what personas you have to target. I'm sure there is not just one persona. So that's something that we need to to set it up. So after you basically define these personas and worked on your pain points, content themes and objective with clear and solid KPI, I used to to do an an audit. So you should audit your basically your your content. You should map uh you know the the the, the sales cycle, your funnel and before you jump into creating more content, you have you, you have a look at what you have got, right? Do an audit, but map this you know to the sales funnel. This is going to show your gaps and priority on what to start creating first, uh, and then we'll identify content uh, that could be recycled or repurposes. You should filter this through personas and you know and target audience to ensure that at the end you have content that matches what they're looking for uh, so it's vital to audit guys uh, the content you have there may be you know there may there, there may be content types that you have produced that would be a better fit if it was reformatted into another content type for instance or uh, this is a very good case you should produce content that is very different according to the platforms in which you're going to be placed um, you know so this is this is another big mistake that I that I see and the uh, number six mistake is using social media as a billboard so that, that's a, that's another big mistake that I normally see uh, and you know guys at the end social media is supposed to be social so I think there is a lot of brands that see social media as a channel to broadcast their marketing messages. And frankly, I, I think that we have been, become a little jaded and don't trust brands and their social content. And some brands struggle to have a unified and authentic brand voice on social media. So if a brand is using a social as a broadcast channel, that's absolutely fair. But the brand voice will never be heard. So that's a reality, guys. You need to understand your audience, how they use social media, uh, you know, uh, and, and max this out with empathy. This is hard to do as you may need to, you know, to let go some of the control and be media neutral, putting yourself in the shoes of your customers. So that's particularly difficult for media companies that I'm talking to uh, or sport entities. They are very traditional, very, you know, formal. And so if you want to reach more users, if you want to increase your audience, uh, you definitely need to be more social and be more, you know, talking at the same language as your audience is talking. The mistake number seven is not cleaning your database. So again, it's a little bit linked to, to the previous point when I was talking about analytics. So the question that you need to, to, to make is, who has a data strategy? 
when I normally talk to you know quite big company, the, at the end we, we we reach out three main uh, three main objectives, right? So the objectives are always the same: one, increasing the revenues; the second, increasing the the, the audience, the traffic, the engagement; and the third one is having and setting up a proper data strategy strategy that can help help me to optimize you know uh, optimize and track better all the analytics that I have and at, at the end is about taking smarter decision and faster decision than before so it's not most of, it, it's not the most glam of all marketing tasks to be totally honest with you but your data is blood that runs through your marketing body and your body may may be a little toxic so having a data strategy and process of how you manage data will keep you your blood flow moving in the right decision. You you will all heard the phrase that B2B data data is faster than B2C. So around 25% of your data on average, just for your information, will be dead in one year. So data is just a proxy for people and the truth is you cannot do email, CRM, direct marketing campaigns to your prospect and customer if your data is poor. So why your campaigns, why your direct messages, why your email marketing, why you know uh, all the the, the, the the activities, the marketing activities you may have are not working well? It may be because your data is really poor. And the term dirty data was created for a reason, no? and you should be scared by it. But what what should you do if you haven't cleaned your database? So. The step number one is, <coughs> sorry, conduct an audit. Where, da- where, where, where does your data sit? It, is it in several places around the business? What form is it? Is it in a CS, CSF, CSV sorry, files? Is a, is a master database in some data in a CRM or another in a marketing automation tool? Uh, you know, wh- where, where is sitting? That's the first answer that you need to get. The second one is delay duplicates. So with a few data depository and different ways to collect data, you will find when you do your audit that you may have the same record on different databases. So, and you need to do dedupe everywhere. So you need to, deduping is not a difficult process to work through and will save a lot of cash. So eliminate the duplication is absolutely a must and the step number three is check and honor preferences so you have a duty to manage your customer preference and to make sure you're keeping in line with the law right so go for your no dedupe data and segment your data sets into who wants to get what and when for example let's make an example you will have people who have unsubscribed, for instance, from, from a survey, from a marketing survey, from an OTT service or whatever, but they should still get customer-related notification. So my, my may have registered with a corporate telephone preference service, the CTPS, is a list of organization, you know, uh, who have registered a wish not to receive unsolicited, unsolicited direct marketing calls. So that's that's something that you need to check, guys. It's it's also about the law. So the next step number four uh, is to enrich your data set. So, and this is something that I always say when I'm talking with a customer. So not all data is equal. You may have a you may have a percentage of data records with just an email, uh, others an email, but not company names. So the more data you have, the better. You can do more personalized email and marketing programs, programs with you know, very improved data. Uh, the step number five is write, write this formal document. So I'm not going to lie you guys today. Data management is very fucking hard and you are more than likely going to need the help of you know, other departments or even external agencies to audit and clean your data. So this will cost... And I must, must to be honest with you, it costs time and money, but not just money and wasted time on hoarding data that is not worth using. So let's also not forget the cost of the fines you can get, for instance, for not, not having a proper, uh, a proper law in place. 
the mistakes number eight is not attributing your marketing efforts so if you have set up your Google Analytics correctly and are taking advantage of event tracking and setting up goals you should then looking towards attribution so uh, you can have a whooping 20 goals per reporting view if you want um, and in this for in this in this case you can set up goals for you know your macro and, and macro conversion what I like to do for instance is use something like data studio and pull in say the top five goals that we are reporting on and then I heat map the conversion rate as a percentage and report on this you know by source so I can understand how many for instance channels marketing channels etc are performing and what role uh, they play in my conversions so let's let's make an example let's say that you have convinced 100 people to complete your lead generation form uh, or the the sign up of your uh, software as a service product who gets the credit for this goal so well <laughs> clearly it will depend on on your attribution model uh, a mistake that I frequently see is a site that has only one or two goals set and they take the report and the conversion rate in acquisition as the final word of the marketing. The results is clearly a very bad choice. So how you collect data, how you clean them up and how you interpret data as well as how you set up all the, all the goals and not just one or two will define the smartest decision that then you will take uh, in your business. So the reason, uh, because there are seven attribution models that Google Analytics uses, and everything, no or multi-channel final reports run on the last non-direct click model. So this means that the last non-direct channel that a customer touches before they convert gets 100% of the credit of the goal completion. Now, Imagine that your typical customer journey look like that. Prospect spotted an, an article, for instance, or a video promoted on Twitter. Then they click on a display advert, right? They sign up, for instance, to, to your newsletter. They find, they find you on Google and click on a paper, uh, paper cost advert per click advert then they type for instance another url directly in your browser and convert into sales so who fucking gets the credit of it so in these examples for instance the paper click campaigns that maybe one of your marketing people has done has run gets all the glory so you will say oh you are a very great guy man you you did the proper campaign the other channels look like they are not working so you get marketing channel where the budget get cut or removed so in this case with this kind of funnel and you're not and you know digging and, and tracking everything you may think that the only thing that is converting is your pay-per-click campaign that's and then you're going to shut down or to you know reduce the the the, the budget for all the other channels just because you think because you put this goal, you set up wrongly on Google, and, 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 and then you take some decisions that are not working good. So the mistake number nine, guys, is using car sales copy. So broadly speaking, marketers are not natural storytellers. And when I'm not, for instance, a very good storyteller, <laughs> and to be honest, I'm not neither marketer, uh, I'm a client kind of mixed person <laughs> between marketing, sales, uh, product, technology. I'm really, really multitasking. But when you do think about writing a copy, or you know, we we are given a copy and asked to make it on brand, uh, we default to the old, f you know, fabulous method, feature, advantage, benefit copy. The problem with you know explaining everything that is about benefits, uh, this is basically what your customer really don't want to listen <laughs> at all actually he doesn't want to listen to all the wonderful features and benefits of your product and service they just don't care enough you need to bring storytelling to the table and inspiring inspiring people to behave differently so now storytelling has become a buzzword in marketing in marketing in the marketing world over the last few years but i think there's something in this we have lost the heart of storytelling that marketing had like over 
let's say 100, 100 years ago, we would rather chest thump our messages like big angry gorillas <laughs> Uh, than to speak to customer that you know uh, the way they really would like to be spoken to so that's that's another thing so how do you do the right customer converting copy well the uh, the first thing is stop talking about yourself for a start again have an honest, have an honest look at your site copy email copy uh, the landing page copy see how many times you have used the word we if you want some tips on writing you know you can you can ask us you can ask me directly my email address is is always the same is fabio at fabiogallo.co.co so you can you can check it out and i'll be happy to to help you the mistake number 10 and by the way i hope you are really enjoying this podcast i know that it's pretty long but there are so many things that i would like to point it out today that i think is very worthy and if you have again any any questions just send me a direct message to me i will be happy to help you uh, um, and by the way the, the 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 mistake number 10 is thinking that user experience is just for web developers so if i'm honest guys even for i totally agree that you know the principle of user experience the first time i started back in 2006 i've used user flow and you know use cases for my for my personal website or for my personal let's say uh, background however for past website project i've left user experience alone and that was a big mistake that i did in the past um, so if you really want to succeed, provide product and service and market them in a way that's really going to connect with your prospect, you need to get into this. It will make you more money, I promise. Usability means making sure something works and something works really well and, and, and that the person of little experience can use it for its intended purposes without getting you know, any frustration. So usability is about making your marketing touch point seamless. You know, instead of customer and website visitor getting frustrated and also very angry at you or your copy or your site's performance. So the key fundamentals of, in my opinion, a good user experience are, are mainly three. So the first one is identify the user needs. So this comes from having a deep understanding of your customers, which take, take shape in the form of personal and customer empathy maps. So this is quite, quite huge work to do. But again, it is something extremely important to do at the real beginning. The second one is understanding your business goal. So you should have a clear KPIs and map back to an objective first approach for all campaigns and activities and marketing funnels that you're creating. The uh, number three is having a technical constraints. So does it better? We always beat did it first. So B2B marketing generally has, has a longer sales cycle. Uh, in Violet, for instance, the sales cycle for, for our product could be between two to nine months for instance and the process then you would find in a b2c and you must have a good understanding of your decision making unit and how you know they go about funding information knowing your customers and prospects and this is something i really explained you before is the most powerful driven of the innovation you can have in a business when you think for instance of a successful businesses they generally have the ability to embrace change. They are data-driven, but above all, they have an obsessive focus on the customer. I was, I was listening, for instance, yesterday to an interview that uh, Reid Hastings uh, did uh, the, the New York Times, and he was saying when they were asking him about Disney Plus and, and the increasing of competition, uh, first of all, it was amazing because he, he really said, I admire Disney. For me, you know, is a company that I can be inspire me. So this is, for instance, in my opinion, this is a great, a great answer as a, as a start. And the second thing he said, look, our competition is not, is not, is not, there, there are so many competitors, he said, 
but the, we are really competing not with a name but we are really competing about watching time so uh, we are competing for viewership so we are not competing with with a specific company so in the, and they are and the third thing that he said and this is related to what i'm saying is that uh, our our obsession is is focused on the customer so we are obsessed on having a great experience on netflix on on bringing the best relevant content for our audience so that's what we are looking for and we want to be the best in delivering this content for the end users so every single decision that every single decision made as its customer at the forefront of their mind and this is one of the hardest skills for marketing because you have to pull your head out of your bubble and put yourself basically in the shoes of the customer but also empathize uh, empathize with them so that's another thing that needs so ha, actually that's a very good point the empathy map in my opinion has six different components one the how the customer thinks and feels so what really counts for the customer what what do they aspire to do what, do they get preoccupied with something else so that's the first thing the second one is what customer hears so things they would hear from their bosses, from friends, peers, influencer, whatever, news, podcast. What channel does your customer use the most? Are they easily influenced? Do they get persuaded more, more by coworkers or from influencers? So those are the questions about what the customer hears. And the number three is what customer sees, guys. So what, what do they see in the physical or online environment? What's your customer expose every day? The number four that you need to answer is what the customer says and does. So ideally, you should put in direct quotes from your customer. How does your customer respond to others? What, what does the customer say to others? What information does your customer hold back from others? Number five is the customer pain. What are the fears, frustration, obstacles, for instance? Try to dig deeper into the pain points from your existing persona, it dive into what your customer fear uh, the most, right? So what obstacles do, do they need to overcome every day? And the number six and last point is the customer's gain. So you should focus basically on their wants and needs, uh, how they will measure success, what kind of success has your customer had, how did they get it, how, what, what long term goal do they have so those kind of um, questions they can map the empathy that you can have with the customer now then i'm talking about you know this empathy map for instance you have you have a persona and co- an, an empathy map and, and and what's next right so you will ask and now that i did it what, what i have to do so the first focus should be around your company's website you should always start, and this is something that I always say to many companies, start from the website. Is that a good website? Are your landing page working? Uh, beyond your site and marketing materials looking good and being a brand, are they easy to follow? Can users find the right information? Uh, can they perform the right action? Can they watch the video, for instance, they are looking for, or the news they are looking for? Having an effective web- website is, is a critical part of you know, the digital marketing, your digital strategy. And more than likely, the website underpins all the campaigns and communication that we do. But good websites requ- require constantly, perpetual improvements, guys. So, and to do, you know, and to improve the website, you need to use... Uh, the flow so user flow right so user flow basically is the path you construct for users to convert you need you need to design each step of your of your flow with intention and watch how traffic how many leads and how many sales are growing um, and the process is simple but powerful and you all we, we all you need is is a sheet of paper pens you know and maybe some post-it notes Use the symbol to walk through the path you want your customer uh, or prospect to take. So in, in, in Vulnit, for instance, we use a whiteboard and we start to, to put our post and you know, map out for, with our clients 
you know what is the flow of the users how they 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 get you know convert for instance into sales what's what kind of different flows uh, they can they can get um, think back to an experience where you have gone through like a few steps only to land on a 4-4 uh, error page uh, or a landing page that you have already been on uh, or the wrong page altogether. So a broken user experience experience is is really hard to recover from. It's, it's absolutely a nightmare. So I, do, I would recommend any you know B two B marketer doing email programs or pay search company campaign. Sorry, and for any process on their site, for instance, they sign up to a newsletter or create an account, etc. Use use this taxi to to map you know to map your process. So guys, I think I think I've I've been uh, exploring ten uh, the the ten biggest mistakes in the in the B two B scenario. I really hope you you enjoy and especially I I really looking forward to to help you and and uh, really have really hope that this could be very helpful for you in the future. You can set up you know uh, maybe. And you can have also different vision of what marketing, product, technology, sales um, combine, align, and, and and make sure and make sure to generate more profit at the end for your company to grow and to also learn more because at the end is about learning. I love learning, and uh, and if I wouldn't learn, I wouldn't probably be assessing all uh, my clients. So the the most important thing is again. Try to go step by step. Um, use your your logics, and then is is the most common sense to do. And and execute, guys. Execute better. All is better. Uh, your strategy is what will make will make uh, you a better in a better position, a better shape. So again, thanks for listening to the audio podcast. Remember, every Friday you will find this audio podcast on Spotify. You will find it on. On, on iTunes, on Google Podcasts, and Spreaker, and other kind of podcast, and I will post it also on YouTube. See you very soon. Bye bye.